Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. My name is Didi Akinyalure, and it's an honor to be your moderator for this Global Trade Review West Africa vet virtual session focused on the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. The Africa Continental Free Trade Area came into effect on the 1st of January, and the successful implementation could potentially be a game changer for the African continent, but there are looming challenges. So this panel will assess the expected logistical and financing benefits brought by the implementation of Pan-African standards, highlight the non-tariff barriers, barrier elimination and infrastructure development that's required to kickstart intra-regional trade and, and offer guidance so we can prepare to gain maximum advantage as the agreement takes root. Today, we are thrilled to be joined by an expert panel. We have Rolake Akikugwe Filani, who's the Chief Commercial Officer at Mixta Africa. Stuart Makura is Director, Supply Chain Finance and Commodity Trade Finance Head for Sub-Saharan Africa at City. Colin Fraser is uh, the CEO of FCMB Bank UK. And Luda Veke is um, um, Luda Veke Mayer is partner at Baker and McKinsey. And uh, panelists, here's a reminder to uh, please keep your answers tight, as this is a 45 minute session, and we would like to give everyone uh, equal opportunity to express their views. So, hello everyone. I hope you're all there. First of all, uh, so. I'm gonna start now. Uh, so the goal is to build a single integrated market on the African continent. I think we can all agree that this was something that was never going to happen overnight. But at the same time, we must uh, spell out the opportunity. So I'd like to start with uh, Rolake, ladies first. Uh, Rolake, are you optimistic about the free trade area and what would successful implementation mean for the continent. Thank you very much, Dee. Great to be here and great to have all my fellow panelists as well. I'm extremely optimistic, Didi. I think in my living memory, or, or should I say conscious memory, of studying Africa and African trade and working across Africa, Africa, not since I think the new Economic Partnership for Africa's Development, the NEPED initiative, have I seen a meeting of minds uh, to this extent on a Pan-African initiative that could essentially transform the economic landscape for the continent. So I'm extremely optimistic. I'm, I'm very optimistic as well, because as we know, interregional trade within Africa today is, is, I think it's probably about, you know, 10% compared to Africa's trade with the rest of the world. And as an executive who works in six African countries today in construction and housing and infrastructure development, I'm really, really banking on having a significant part of how I do business be improved and accelerated by this agreement. Uh, but despite the optimism, as we know, it's gonna take considerable political will to see this through, to get 54 countries to agree and unify both the economies and their minds and hearts on, on this. But, you know, I look forward to discussing some of the challenges and pitfalls and how we might avoid them going forward. Thank you. Didi, I think you're on mute. Ah, yeah. <laughs> All right, now I'd like to add you in or bring you in at this point, Ludovic. Where, where are the opportunities here? Um. Look, I mean, it's, it's, it's huge, and uh, I, I completely agree and share the sentiment that Raraki has expressed. Um, I think the, the biggest opportunities is, I mean, we, uh, I mean, 18% of Africa trades with itself, or eight, trade within Africa represents about 18% of trade, whereas with the rest of the world, it's about, if you look at Europe and Asia, it's about 50%. Um, and, um, you know, if, if, if you just look at, at the numbers, um, you know, we've got a GDP, uh, a combined GDP of about 4 trillion. We've got, you know, 54 countries signed up with the only exception is Eritrea. We've got all the economic zones signed up. 
Um, and for me, the, the, the biggest opportunity is, um, is for, it, it, it's the enablement of a partnership between government and the private sector to bring construction, infrastructure, production um, onto, into the African markets. Um, because, you know, at the moment we are exporting most of our, 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 our commodities uh, for manufacturing outside of, South, outside of Africa. And I think one of the biggest opportunities is, is beneficiation of, 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 of the supply chain. Um, I agree with Rulaki, it's going to take a huge amount of political will. Um, one of the biggest challenges is going to be around tariffs, regulation. Um, but they are encouraged because, you know, if you look at some of the development banks like, like in Afrexum, who's made facilities available to certain countries who are going to have to reduce their tariffs to make up for that shortfall in revenues. Um, so the, the will is there. Um, I think the political will is there. I would love to see the private sector embracing it and bringing the expertise onto, onto the continent. It's going to be the biggest free trade zone in the world with uh, you know, biggest representation of countries ever. So it, it's significant. Right, it is significant. And, you know, we often talk about the logistical benefits of the uh, free trade area, but um, for Stuart, perhaps you could point out the financing benefits for us. Uh, Stuart, you're on mute. Uh, thank you for having me and good morning to everyone. I think with the onset of the Africa free trade, uh, it's the beginning of a journey, right? We already have uh, the 10 to 18% range of trade that is currently happening. And in order to lubricate that underlying trade, we need to have access to financing facilities because that's what makes the trade get around. And with the aims of the Africa free trade uh, in the near, medium and long term uh, to ev eventually reach uh, in excess of $1.3 trillion by the year 2040 uh, to service the population of 1.3 billion Africans, uh, the opportunity for financing will also increase. So I think the initial building blocks for putting that in place have started, but we have to work hand in hand. Um, we have to be coordinated. We have to try and figure out efficient ways of um, implementing this Africa free trade so as to attract the financing. Um, I think the money is available. There are some things that need to happen in Africa. For example, the way we've been able to um, leverage uh, the mobile telephony to leapfrog communications in Africa, we are in a position where we can start looking at digital enhancements in order to facilitate the settlement of these trades. In terms of volumes, uh, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, the opportunity exists for both local institutions with huge African deposits, as well as external financing, because the investors are looking for return. And the more you have an organized regulated market, the easier it will be for investors to start working. To the extent that we start seeing successes in the underlying trades, the more investment we will start to attract, both from you know, trading itself, readying ourselves for trade, the building of infrastructure, and, um, and so on. So I would say that we don't have a lack of uh, financing, but we just need to put the right building blocks in place in order to attract it. Right. And obviously, hopefully, we'll start to see that, you know, once that's set in, we might see, you know, foreign direct investment, you know, it, you know boosting foreign direct investment on the continent. But Colin, I'd like to get your thoughts on um, how, how you think that the free uh, trade area would 
make us more attractive globally. Thank you very much and, and good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think uh, uh, the first thing that I would say is that I don't think there's been a, a free trade area that's been set up in history that hasn't catalyzed both investment and trade. And clearly the scale of this free trade area is going to make it very, very interesting um, around the world. It, 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 it moves away from people thinking about individual country markets to thinking about a, a free trade area. And I agree with the comments that have been said earlier that there will be work to do to create the infrastructure in order to get this working well. In a way, the timing is amazing because we're moving into this digitized world. And in terms of being able to operate a digital, to operate digital platforms that can facilitate this, uh, the timing is fantastic for that. And if you look at the, <clears throat> the number of um, tech firms that have sprung up across Africa, including many unicorns, it shows you that the, you know, that the, the capability is there to do that. And that will very much catalyze what happens. But I think if you look at it from the perspective of global investors, they're going to see a single, much more of a single market. They will want to see that it beds. They will want to see that it's frictionless. They will have concerns about things like physical infrastructure. But again, trade and investment can power um, the development of physical infrastructure as well as the, the trading of um, uh, goods. So I think the opportunities there are, are also significant. So uh, it's going to make it attractive. And I think you'll see a lot of multinationals who traditionally have shipped into a, to the African continent from abroad reassess the value of being able to be present on the ground. And I think there will be an awful lot of uh, foreign investors who will be looking very hard at that. Right. So it's clear that, you know, you're all optimistic about the free trade area, but well, I care, perhaps you could point out the potential pitfalls. Okay, where do I start? <laughs> I don't want to sound like a passy pooper here, but okay. So let me start with the fact that trade is highly political. Um, and we see this around the world. Um, I think when we look at some of the other trade agreements that we're seeing around the world, and even within Africa, take the sub-regional blocks, the principle and philosophy is always sound. But what we find in Africa is that you've had certain economic and trade agreements that have to be drink, driven by strong political personalities who take ownership to cascade it down at national level. So today in Africa, we have a plethora of common markets and we can learn from the stories of how those have worked and how they've not worked. But the first thing is that regional policy has to be owned by national governments. You can't just situate it at the African level. All the stakeholders within those countries have to understand what this means in practice. And then there is the issue of economic convergence within Africa. You know, I studied EU politics at, at one point and EU policy. And today, many African countries are at different stages of growth and some are lagging behind, let's face it, in terms of economic growth. And whilst we know that the, the trade agreement is ultimately meant to contribute to long term growth, we need to define certain economic pa parameters that will make it easier for the signatory countries to comply. Because the reality is, Diddy, when the rubber hits the road, most countries will still look inwards. And we do have some level of economic nationalism today across Africa. And then the final point I wanted to make on the challenges is that, you know, I, I hear what Stuart says about, you know, single trading block for Africa's international partners to do business with. But if we take the rules of origin for manufacturing in Africa, one of the areas that I have been studying in my work in energy and infrastructure is the global battery value chain. We know China, for instance, has been a big player in the global supply of batteries for solar PV and whatnot. But if we want to encourage beneficiation within the African context for countries like the DRC that are the main producers of battery minerals, we need to make sure that now that Africa essentially has created its own trading table, that it is able to determine the rules of engagement when it comes to the rules of origin. The idea here is that if a good originates within Africa, then it should enjoy free movement across African borders. But we, we haven't really plugged the loopholes in our current trade position and bargaining power with powers like China. So I think those are some of the issues that will be really key to address. Otherwise, this will just become another nameplate initiative without real implementation on the ground. 
Wow. <laughs> I mean, we're going to touch on um, our relationship with well, what this means for our relationship with other big trading partners um, like China and also um, around the rules of, of uh, origin uh, slightly later on. But, um, you know, I, I'd like you, Stuart, to sort of follow on from that point that, you know, Rolake made, you know, particularly because we are looking at tackling some of these pitfalls from a Pan-African perspective. And sometimes that's difficult to do when you're dealing with countries with differences in everything from policy to currency. So what's your thoughts on this, Stuart? Yeah, look, um, I think, you know, since 2012, when um, the whole idea of African free trade was put into action by the AU, we have started on a journey. It's not something that's going to be arrived at overnight. We have to have concerted effort in how we start implementing, and there needs to be some flexibility. But what needs to remain clear are the goals that Africa Free Trade is looking to achieve. So in regards to how governments interact with each other, we've had some practice rounds, if you like, you know, through the trade blocks that we already have in Africa, uh, like ECOWAS, the East Africa block, SADAC, um, where people are starting to consider and look at how to work together for common good. Um, those are initial building blocks. We need to work on them. There have been uh, regional trading blocks that have been established before us. Some of them took much longer than others. I think the biggest one at the moment is the European Union. And those provide lessons for Africa from which we can learn, um, you know, what is best practice, what to avoid, how do we make sure that we can achieve the goals of Africa free trade, which espouse coordination economically, freedom of movement of goods, and uh, intra and intra-Africa trade without pouncing on issues of sovereignty uh, and letting countries run the issues that pertain to them from a political standpoint and realizing what our common goal is. So really the parties have to have the goodwill that for like I mentioned, or like I mentioned uh, but this goodwill has to go beyond, you know, within the country. It has to be on an international level. And knowing that what might look initially as a benefit to one specific neighbor will actually in the end be a benefit for, for, for the whole region. So coordination really is the key point, I believe. Coordination is the key point. All right, uh, Ludovic, I, I want to get your thoughts from a legal policy or regulatory perspective, because I think that's, that is really key, you know, to get right. Uh, in, in, in your view, what needs to be done here to ensure successful implementation? Ooh, I, I mean, it is, it's, in, it's, it's integration, you know, as you know, or as many of you know, um, you know, they are principally three legal systems in, in, uh, in, in the continent, and I'm excluding North Africa, so let's just talk about Sub-Saharan Africa. You've got the Francophone, the Lusophone, and the Anglophone markets. But, um, you know, I've been, I've been advising clients for longer than, well, as an, as an in-house counsel, but now in private practice for longer than, than 13 years now, and on deals in Africa. And I am still to encounter, uh, an inability to, to transact because of a legal impediment. Um, I have often, on many occasions, I would, I would venture to say on a weekly basis, find that there may be a lack of regulation. But a lack of regulation does not mean that there is not a legal principle that can be used to develop regulation. So, Sometimes people think that, you know, because the, the regulatory framework is underdeveloped, the law cannot assist you in, in making deals, in closing deals, and protecting your interests in country. It's a matter of, of understanding. It's a little bit like the political will. You know, you need to respect and understand the, the legal system in each and every country. Then you know, how can that enable you to do the business that you need, because I mean, in my 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 
personal view is that um, you know the the integration of of business will just create a bigger market. So if I look in my practice at the moment and compare it to two or three years ago and taking account that we're in the COVID environment, what I'm very encouraged to see is that how development institutions has come to the table to provide liquidity in some difficult African markets, but equally also how through collaboration between international banks, development banks and big corporations, um, they are investing in the country. So in other words, they're creating scale, improving efficiencies. And unfortunately, the law is a, is a little bit like um, the snail on the tortoise's back um, in that it moves very, very slowly. Yeah. I am, I am always encouraged to say that um, you cannot let the law or the lack of a regulation hold you back when you do business. You need to understand your risk and your appetite for risk will then inform as to whether you're going to be proceeding with the transaction or not. And, and that requires a deep understanding and respect for, for all the markets um, within the zone. Right. Um, we've got about 20 minutes more before we move on to take some questions. But um, I think one of the things that you've, you, I can't remember who pointed this out, but you know, we have African countries that are a lot more prepared for this than others. Uh, we have some African countries that stand to benefit more, at least in the short term, than, than others. Um, and you know, there are you know, countries that fear losing out to uh, more competitive neighbors. So, uh, Colin, I just want to get your thoughts. In your opinion, how do we make this fair for all? So I think the first thing to say when you talk about countries that are potential winners and countries that, let's say, might take longer to benefit, that's probably true. But it's not necessarily um, a reason, you know, not to move ahead or to, to be worried. Uh, there's a, a good expression, which is that a rising tide floats all boats. And if you look at the implementation of free trade areas elsewhere, uh, you know, you will see some countries that will move ahead more quickly, but you will see the opportunities move cross border, whether it's trade driven, whether it's investment driven, whether it's infrastructure driven. Um, the key is staying power. The key is, you know, that when you put in something like this, there's a great fanfare, everybody's very excited. And let's be honest, it's an amazing achievement to get so many countries to collaborate in this way. It's extraordinary. Um, but then there's a risk, you know, one year down the line, two years down the line, three years down the line, there will be people saying, well, is this doing anything for us? We can see what it's doing over there, but is it doing anything for us? So a willingness to stay the course is important. And then in terms of how it becomes fair for all or, or level for all, really that's then up to individual countries to think about what this platform gives them and work out how to align themselves to that platform. Are we creating other barriers to, to business? Do we have practices in our country or issues in our country which uh, are disincentives and <clears throat> will send people to, to areas of the, you know, the free trade area where they feel more comfortable or they, you know, they think life will be easier? Um, and it's a case of looking at um, all of those components and making sure that, you know, you're learning the lessons and you're making domestic changes that allow you to leverage the benefit. And different parts of the continent have different resources, they have different skill sets, they have different economic drivers, if you like. And it's about learning how to leverage those. And the market will, the market will respond to, to changes that are made to make business more effective. Um, and I think different uh, foreign investors will, will look at the free trade area and see different opportunities, different drivers, different places that they want to be. Uh, and then I think for those countries that, you know, are getting ahead, it, you know, they're obviously getting significant benefits. So it becomes beholden on them to think about how to make sure that the whole area is benefiting and the whole area is doing well. And you saw that very significantly in the European Union where the European Union um, you know, made significant efforts to make sure that areas such, for example, as the more recent joiners in Eastern Europe 
uh, had a platform that allowed them to catch up and benefit as well. Uh, and that's how you reinforce that trade area. Right. Now, th this is something that Rolake pointed out as well. You know, um, now, Stuart, I want to bring you in here because, you know, as Rolake said, the other thing to consider is, is, you know, what this would mean for Africa's relationship with uh, other big trading partners like China. Um, there's some people that say that this will hurt business with China, while some say that China actually stands to benefit most in, in the short to medium term um, via ease of trade. Of course, that depends on rules of origin, but China also benefits from the building of infra infrastructure to support trade. So what's, what's your stance on this, Stuart? Um, look, you know, you, when you have large trading partners such as China, the US, Germany, and so forth, um, they are looking for opportunities. That is this, the starting point. And those opportunities happen to be in Africa. So regardless of how we progress, China will continue to seek those opportunities. And my belief is that in putting together something like the free trade area actually should make business easier between Africa and China, because they would no longer need to be dealing with 54 different trade counterparties, but rather looking at a unified trade block. Yes, there needs to be some adjustments in the beginning and some homogenization. Some of the advantages that a country like China might have been taking because of um, differentials in terms of need, because obviously if you're dealing with somebody who doesn't have a lot of power to negotiate, you strike a very good deal for yourself. So they would need to give some ground with respect to some of those type of transactions as they maneuver to work with a single block. And with respect to Africa as well, um, you know, by positioning a united front it means that you will be a much stronger trading block and you can be much more coordinating, offering the best out of a whole continent um, with respect to dealing with China. It is up to Africa to write the rules of how we're going to trade with China. Um, uh, Rolake touched on um, the goods of origin. What are those rules about the, uh, the goods of origin? What is it that a country like China can do in order to take advantage of these goods of origin instead of getting extractive materials shipped all the way to China so that they can come back in battery mode? Why don't China start looking at establishing investments in Africa where the supply value chain can be enhanced, be it in the DRC or in some other African country where the requirements to, um, to enhance that value chain can easily be attained. That mm -hmm. is the only way that China can remain competitive. Uh, so it really starts to change the mindset, or at least from my perspective, it should, it should change China's mindset in how it interacts with Africa. How can they continue to benefit from this relationship? And I actually believe that making investments in Africa would be one of those things. I can see um, Ludovic um, nodding there. So I, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on this or any alternative view on, you know, how we should tackle our, you know, relationship with, uh, you know, other big trading partners like, like China going on and also um, on the rules of uh, origin. Um, no, I mean, I, 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 I agree. I agree with, with, with what Stuart is saying, but, you know, let's not forget um, we have the BRICS as well. We have the, um, uh, you know, I, I think India is 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 playing a, a bigger part in investment on on the continent. Um, it's going to be very interesting how the U.S. plays out. Stuart, you mentioned the U.S. You're working for a U.S. institution, but you know, I think we're all very encouraged by the new administration, and 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 we hope that um, you know. What's happening at US Exum is, is also encouraging. Um, so, so no, I agree. But you know, the, the bottom line for me is, 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 is that 
by, by integrating better, um, let, take, take the battery example that Rulakli is. is, is. Yeah. If you can get Zambia and the DRC, for instance, to, to collaborate, uh, attract investment, and between those two countries, which is mainly you know, the biggest resource uh, for, 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 for battery manufacturing, uh, and you can bring that value chain into that market, I mean, the beneficiation is just incredible. And I think what, some, what is sometimes forgotten is that um, revenue collection mm -hmm. should be a key consideration within the policy frameworks and within the politics <laughs> of, 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 the, of, of the free trade zone. Because I think many, many African economies are losing out on revenue collection as a result of the extractive nature um, of, of the trade and that, you know, the export of, of, of raw materials is, 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 is absolutely, um, you know, does not give you the revenue that you would be generating if you, if you capture the entire value chain within your country. So not to talk about job creation, um, you know, I spoke about efficiency, scale, it, it just, you know, there's, there's no legal issue here. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm really encouraged by, by bringing yeah. value chains um, together. All right. Um, and I think, you know, we, we mentioned this earlier, you know, that there are lessons that perhaps we could learn from um, other regions that have, you know, achieved this, even though, you know, for example, when you look at the European Union, it, it took decades, right? So, Colin, I guess you could come in here, you know, are, are there any lessons that we could learn from uh, a region like the EU? I think that <clears throat> the first lesson, is, as you rightly said, Didi, is that, you know, you have to understand that these things will, will happen over a very significant amount of time. And, you know, obviously where you see quick wins, uh, it reinforces the, the value of it. Uh, I think the other thing to say is that what's also important is not to be always looking outside of this new free trade zone to the rest of the world. It should also catalyze a lot of stuff within itself. Okay, so it shouldn't be all about China. It shouldn't be all about India uh, or the European Union. What is it going to catalyze inside this new area? And there's an enormous amount of uh, exciting businesses that are uh, emerging, um, powered by the, the, the telecom uh, infrastructure that's been created which offer in, enormous opportunities. Not all trade has to be physical. It can also be about services. And actually, I think one of the lessons of the European Union is that uh, it actually created a very significant growth in the service economy, as well as the uh, industrial economy. And that goes back to how you deal with some of the winners and losers stuff. So you might see manufacturing be strong in certain parts of the free trade area, but there's no reason why other countries shouldn't build very, very strong service capability, particularly, you know, where education is, is, is strong and where the, you know, the people agenda is there. So <clears throat> again, that goes to, <clears throat> it, it mustn't be beggar your neighbor. It must be all about working out where you can leverage it and, and taking advantage. And I think a lot can happen uh, within that trade zone. I think, um, at the risk of saying saying something that that, that maybe um, uh, sitting in Europe I shouldn't say, but I think one of the challenges that the European Union has had is that it's become quite a political entity, and it's moved its agenda away from its roots as a free trade area um, into a much more political world, talking about issues around integration, talking about where the balance balance of power sits between a secretariat uh, and national governments. And I think if uh, this free trade area can avoid that and double down on the trade opportunities and the investment opportunities that catalyze off the back of it um, and try and uh, avoid adding a layer around sort of political integration, which, which needn't be overt. It can be quite covert in terms of what things people want to start harmonizing. Um, but it can be very distracting and it can go into a nationalist uh, agenda very, very easily. So I think the more that this can stick to trade, the more you will see the economic benefits come through. And I think 
you know, the, the absolute primary goal here needs to be to catalyze ongoing strong economic development, pulling, pulling resources and, and finance in from around the world and catalyzing it within the area itself. Right. I guess the question now is where do we go from here? And there's, there's actually a really good question that's coming um, from our viewers. Uh, thank you all for the questions that you're sending in. I can see each and every single one of them. And hopefully we will be able to tackle some, uh, get some of the answers to some of those. Um, Ronika, you talked about rules of origin. I know that that's something that, you know, everyone's sort of waiting to, um, you know, see what comes out of you with that. But there's, there's a question that says, what in your opinion is the next major milestone in progressing the implementation of the agreement? So in other words, what's next? You know, what should we be focusing on now and what kind of tangible effects and timeframes are, are expected? In, in your view? Uh, that's, that's a big question, uh, Dee. <laughs> I hope I can do some justice to it. But I, I actually wanted to quickly touch on two things that just popped yeah. to mind and thinking through what Colin said on the EU. One of the things that concerns me as an executive today, I work across six African countries, is the ability to employ labor across Africa mm -hmm. and the ability to set up very easily. And, and when I think of one of the offshoots of the EU is the Schengen visa policy. Uh, but when you cascade that to the business level, one of the things that worked for, for the business I worked for in London, Echo Bank, is that we applied, we set up our London representative office under the EU passport because we had the Paris headquarters. And I think we really need to look at specific opportunities to accelerate the ease of doing business on the African continent and the ease with which pan-African businesses can employ labor. So whether that becomes a sub segment of the continental free trade agreement, both for businesses and labor, I think that would be really good. In terms of what next needs to happen next, I think it's all about implementation. When you speak to the average young person here in Africa about understanding the Africa trade agreement and what this means, or you speak to someone in customs, there's still a lack of awareness of how what this means at the national level. And I remember many years back when I was doing a road trip from Mali to Burkina Faso and many before I embarked on this Pan-African trip had glorified my ECOWAS passport. I can move freely between the borders. I think between just two countries in the Sahel, we encountered about 15 different roadblocks, despite the fact that we had what it was evidentially on paper, a, a regional passport. So the point I'm trying to make here is that African governments needs to, need to start looking internally who are the key stakeholders within our countries that will be responsible for implementing this on the ground. And I think it needs to be phased. We need to avoid biting off more than we can chew. But I think we also need to clearly define what this means for SME. So I would say the implementation at a national level, and it starts with ownership, right? Um, we also need to define what it means for different segments of the market. I'm very, very keen on easing the, 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 the business environment within the continent, and particularly the prospects of African SMEs. So those would be my, my key priorities going forward. Right. Uh, I like what you mentioned about easing the business environment. And I, I know that, you know, financing and funding is, 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 is you know, is, is something that is of utmost importance when it comes to easing um, business and uh, earlier we spoke about the financing benefits. Um, you know, I think I'm not sure if this is probably more Colin or Stuart, but perhaps one of you could tackle this. Um, what 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 do you think African banks must do in order to to support the you know um, implementation of of the free trade area? Because obviously, you know, if, if we're looking at this from a business perspective, then uh, banking is is an important area to to tackle. Colin. Um. I think, there's a, <clears throat> I think there's a couple of things. Um, there's a lot of liquidity in the world right now that is looking to go to work and looking to find yield. Um, it wants to find the right um, balance of risk and return. So I think um, there is uh, plenty of uh, money in, in the world's financial centers um, where there is appetite for African risk, African financial institution risk, um, particularly where... Um, it's focused on um, activities like trade, which traditionally, you know, are, if you like, safer lending. So if I look at London, the London markets, you know, look, central banks have had the printing press presses on since the global financial crisis. There is a lot of liquidity in the world. Interest rates are rock bottom. Um, everyone from depositors to investors are all seeking yield. 
So there's plenty of money to go to work. And I actually think with a free trade area, uh, that, that makes it easier um, for the global financial centers to uh, direct liquidity uh, to support trade activity. Um, you know, I see um, in, in, in my day job very significant levels of trade activity happening through London, uh, and I only expect that to grow. So for African banks, they just need to make themselves a banking bankable proposition to the financial markets. They need to be well governed. They need to be well run. Uh, you know, they need to, to operate to good standards, um, global standards, the, the standards of how banks need to operate, whether it's conduct, whether it's liquidity, whether it's capital. And, um, you know, those uh, those standards are high and they're, they're rising. And actually, that's a good thing because it will help the financial markets channel really material amounts of liquidity uh, into the African banking system, and particularly for those institutions that meet those standards. Uh, and then their ability to then uh, finance trade, whether it's um, you know, outside the area coming in or vice versa, or intra the free trade area, uh, will be more and more possible. And there's no reason that uh, African banks can't grow um, pretty rapidly their capacity uh, to support trade and working capital within the free trade area, in my view. Right. And um, another question I'm going to bring in from um, our viewers. Uh, this one is quite interesting. It says, uh, could the panel address the elephant in the room? That is the impact of corruption on trade and related financing. Who's going to take that one? Yeah, I'm happy to get yeah, okay. Um So, I mean, I think, I think, this, I think it's a generalization. And um, uh, I, my, my own view is that um, if you structure your transactions adequately, uh, you know your customer mm -hmm. uh, and your systems and can, can support your, your, your trades, um, you know, I, I can see no reason why you should fall the victim of, of a fraud or of, right. of corruption. The fact is, um, it's always been around, um, but I am encouraged that um, as part of the Africa Free Trade Agreement, we're going to have access to better data. We're going to have access to better credit data, um, and that should be a game changer on um, informing right. uh, the risk in transactions. All right. Um, I, I wanted to get a last word in, uh, Stuart. So uh, one minute, because we've got, we've got two minutes left, literally. So uh, final comments from you, or you know, do you want to talk on that as well? Yeah. Look, um, I, I think I just wanted to um, leave uh, the conference with uh, a view on some of the opportunities that exist uh, for Africa free trade, particularly opportunities that exist for government. You know, government really can uh, start looking at prioritizing the inclusion of private sector uh, mm -hmm. in the development of infrastructure and industrial development. I mean, for example, if you look at what we are seeing uh, evolving out of Nigeria with the Dangote refinery, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that is literally attracting billions of dollars into the country from a, uh, uh, from a single project. Uh, and we are seeing encouraging signs in the fields of energy as well with uh, the yeah. development of, 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 of solar and power. Those are the things that will hold us in good stead into the future. We need to put the building blocks. Yeah. It's not going to be overnight. And then um, as far as opportunity for investors, investors need to Ten look seconds. at <laughs> investing in trade enabling infrastructure and the developing of value chains uh, right. that enhance trade because right. it is a journey. It is All a journey. Right. I think that's a good place to leave it. Uh, we have like less than a, mi a minute. I wish we had more time for this conversation, but there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Global Trade Review, I'd like to thank our panelists today, Rolake Akinkube Filani, Stuart Makura, Ludovic Meyer, and Colin Fraser. Thank you for sharing your views on the Africa continental free trade area and for your guidance on its successful implementation. And thank you to all our viewers for joining in today and for your questions. Have a good day, everyone, and thank you.